Happy Friday, everyone. It's John Lorden here with another Brain Scratch for all of you on December 8th, 2017. Hope you had a nice week. This one is uh, pretty tough. This is a case where it's um, as tragic as it is mysterious. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the case of Jessica Renee Johnson. And basically, it boils down to a question of did Jessica end her own life or is something else at play here? And uh, this happened in June of 2017. You might have seen some press on this. It did hit uh, a couple of, of news outlets, um, primarily for the way that she was found. She was uh, tied to a mailbox using a shoelace that was around her neck and then hooped over the mailbox. And a lot of people really question, is that a reasonable way for someone to end their own life? And I do believe it is an extremely valid question. Uh, there are images of her available online. Um, I'm not going to show them in this video because it's, it's pretty disturbing. There's two main versions that I've seen. One of them has about half of her face blurred out, just kind of the top half around her eyes. And the other one has her whole face blurred out. The issue with the one that has her whole face blurred out is you can't really get a good sense of where the shoelace is going. Um, the other one where only part of her face is ob obstructed, you get a much better sense of the path of the shoelace. And the best way I can describe it um, is I believe the shoelace was put around her neck and then twisted into like a figure eight and then put up around the top post of the mailbox. It looks like it's a, a pretty simple twist that is happening in there. Um, there's a lot of people analyzing the photo just wondering, you know, uh, with the indentation that you can see from the shoelace around her neck, uh, could that really have have ended her life. Uh, the way that the shoelace is hooped over her, um, her throat, is it, is it in a, a position that would actually help, um, you know, choke her or to stop her uh, ability to breathe? I can't tell you for sure. I can just tell you that experts are split on this. You've got a coroner on one side that says this is all pretty cut and dry. It looks like she ended her own life. You have an expert that's been hired by the family that's raising a lot of questions, and we're going to get into some of those as we go. But let's start with some of the basics of the story. Uh, Horn Lake, Mississippi. At around 11 a.m. on June 2nd, a mail carrier found something shocking, the body of 37-year-old Jessica Johnson hanging in a squatting position from a 38-inch mailbox with shoestrings tied around her neck. And this, uh, I don't know if that's the actual mailbox because I think they were trying to keep the person's identity cleared, but it's, it certainly looks like this same type of mailbox. Um, so if you can imagine, she is basically on her knees right next to the mailbox and the shoestring is going kind of over the top part. Uh, actually, it's a little bit lower, kind of in between where the mailbox and the post is, uh, and then around her neck from there. And here we have a photo of Jessica. And um, I've learned just a little bit about her past. She worked at a logistics company. Uh, she has two children. One of them is 19. The other one's considerably younger. Um, the, the, her son is 19. I believe her daughter is around five, somewhere around there. Um, of course, she is also a daughter. Her mother and father are very upset. She also has a sister and she has a lot of friends that have been talking up about this case as well. And many people are just asking the same questions over and over. Um, a lot of them are, why did the police not look into this as a possible foul play? Um, just because of the way that, you know, the conditions around how she was found, it's certainly an interesting question. Crime Watch Daily did a series on this. Uh, it's four separate videos. They also have a web page where they've kind of basically just typed out all of the information that's given out in those videos. I'm going to have links to that right at the top of the description down below. Um, they usually do a really good job digging in. I have spoken to some people that have worked with them before, and they can say that sometimes facts could get a little twisted on their coverage. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any expert on this case at this time to tell me if any of those facts are uh, in that same category of maybe not being completely uh, solid. But 
it's a very interesting watch. You will see um, all of the main players in this interviewed. Um, a couple of people that you might consider suspects be inter are also interviewed, and a lot of footage with the expert that is working for the family and his thoughts and theories on this. Uh, police in Horn Lake, Mississippi suspect suicide, and the coroner has listed the preliminary cause of death as ling ligature strangulation. Family and friends insist that Johnson, who was the mother of a 19-year-old son and an 8-year-old daughter, there we go, uh, would not take her own life. Uh, this picture also raises some controversy. Uh, a lot of people, uh, friends and family, are saying that they see a shoe print in this picture of her arm. Um, I am not certain that it's a shoe print. My initial assumption when I looked at it was it could possibly be grass, depending on the placement of her arm. Uh, you can see, even in this photo, uh, the grass at the at the mailbox she was found out was fairly high. And in the photo, you can see where that arm is placed. That arm is actually right up against the wood of the post. Um, so my initial assumption was that that could have been markings left from an indentation of all the different grass fibers kind of pushing up between her arm and the post. But other people, for example, on web sleuths are theorizing it's actually the grain of the wood because it's a rough type of grain that is on that mailbox post. Johnson, who lived with her mother in Horn Lake, left home on May 31st. According to Linda, her daughter was planning to spend a few days with her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Garland Hart. Linda described the couple's relationship as toxic. She said she FaceTimed her daughter on June 1st who said she was going home, but she never made it. Um, ju just to be clear about this, her parents have been very clear about this. Jessica did struggle with some addiction issues. Her mother, uh, when interviewed by Crime Watch Daily, specifically said that she believed Xanax was Jessica's drug of choice. Uh, the coroner did do a toxicology report. We're going to get to those results in a, in a little while. The family has enlisted the help of Dr. Maurice Godwin, a criminal investigative psychologist. It is his opinion that Johnson likely died at another location and the scene was, quote, staged as a hanging. Uh, and another interesting thing here, they have a picture of her shoe. I've heard it reported two different ways. Either her shoes were actually inside this friend's house or her shoes were right outside of this friend's house, but not close to where she was actually found. Um, so supposedly she had taken the laces off her shoes. Uh, in one version of this story, she even makes a comment to a roommate that lives at this house that she might do something to harm herself. The roommate kind of dismisses her and closes the door. Um, she apparently leaves the shoes near the house, takes the laces and walks away. So it is a very interesting question in terms of um, this type of area. There's not a lot of street lights out here. There's not a lot, a lot of lighting that you have in this type of area. And if you're going to go walking off to try to find some place to end your life, are you really going to do that without shoes and really any way of seeing where you're going? Um, just a, a lot of, of really tough questions in this case. Godwin also points out how difficult it would have been to tie the shoelaces around the mailbox as tightly and neatly as they were herself from a sitting position. Um, in the photo, you can see how the shoelaces are tight. It is a pretty a pretty tight knot and the, I think they're called aglets, the ends of the shoelaces are very close to where the actual knot is. Now, I believe he's assuming that she tied this while she was kneeling right next to the um, post office or right next to the mailbox. I don't think that that's the case. Uh, as I kind of described it to you guys, the way that I see it is she probably would have tied it first. It, this is assuming that this is an instance where she did this to herself. She could have tied it first and created the hoop then put the hoop over her head, twisted it once, and then put the other end over the post. Um, but I don't think that, um, that Mr. Godwin is, is thinking about that possibility here. The person who owned the home that Johnson was found in front of told WMC5 that she and Hart showed up on Wednesday. He last saw her on Thursday and said she had gotten into a fight with Hart and seemed emotionally distraught. He said later that night, she sent him a text saying she just didn't want to feel the pain anymore or anything. 
And there's a lot of strange information that's coming out of this person that owns the house. Um, once again, I just have to recommend you guys check out the Crime Watch Daily links that are down below. Um, first of all, there's a camera on his house. He has a camera system that actually faces the mailbox. For some reason, police never asked him for that footage. Uh, when Crime Watch Daily asked him for that footage, he acted like he couldn't remember the passcode to get to it. And by the way, it was probably written over anyway. Uh, very, very odd. And there's some comments he makes that we're going to get to later that are even a little more odd than that. Um, this story that she would text him, I don't quite understand. And admittedly, we don't know the dynamics of what's going on in this house. My gut is that this is... A, probably a bit of a party environment. You've got her boyfriend that we know who struggles with drugs living there. Uh, she struggles with drugs from time to time. Uh, they're fighting seemingly in the middle of the night. Uh, other people are trying to stay clear of it. And then why is she going to send a text message saying something like this to the guy that owns the house? I personally seriously question if this text message was sent by her. And it's tough because we don't have a lot of detail uh, on the time of that text message or anything like that. So it's just something that's kicking around in my head. I think it's something that we have to question. A lot of this guy's information seems very wishy-washy. Uh, his identity has not really been released. Apparently, he's worried about uh, possibly getting death threats or people threatening him uh, because they think that he's involved in this in some way. Hart, that's her boyfriend, reportedly has an active warrant in Tennessee for domestic assault bodily harm in a separate case. And we can actually see here at shelbywarrants.org uh, that that is true, domestic assault bodily harm charge. Um, and we can see that it was issued September 21st of 2017. And if you click on the photo, you can confirm that is indeed her boyfriend. So all of that information certainly pans out. Now, heavy.com has also done some coverage on this. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of this website in terms of the information they pulled together, but sometimes I kind of question their sources. They have a very interesting tidbit here that I don't see repeated in a lot of places, but I think it's worth discussing. Uh, Moreno is actually a friend of hers and has become a bit of a spokesperson. I believe her name's Leanne, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, Leanne Moreno. Uh, she's become a bit of a spokesperson for the family. She's also trying to collect as much information as possible uh, using uh, social media. Uh, she was told that the ex-boyfriend changed the code on Johnson's phone and is the only person who knows the code. Basically, they have Jessica's phone, but no one can unlock it at this point. Uh, and I don't know, I really don't know where this information's coming from, but if this is true, that for some reason, um, Hart changed the code on the phone, you really have to wonder why. You really have to wonder, is that the only thing he did? Or is he potentially responsible for sending that text message we talked about earlier? And her son, her 19-year-old son, also received a text message, I believe somewhere after three o'clock in the morning. There's some question of if she was even still alive at that point. So if this is true, that he did indeed, that Garland Hart, here's a picture of him, did manipulate the phone in some way, I'm really surprised why authorities didn't look into that more. Um, another thing is apparently her phone had a fingerprint scanner. Unfortunately, she has since been cremated, but if authorities would have thought to possibly use her fingerprint scanner, they probably could have opened it when they still had access uh, to her. They could have at least unlocked her phone. From what I've seen, her parents are working with Apple, but that requires some type of court order. So they're trying to go through the legal processes to get the information from that phone. I'll be very curious to see if, if any new revelations can come out of the info that they get on that. Uh, this also notes that he hasn't been cooperative with the family. Once again, in the Crime Watch daily footage, they actually interview him for a segment. And uh, he's very clear that he knows the family is blaming him essentially for this, that they think that he did something to her. So uh, I, I kind of understand why he's not going to be exactly cooperative with the family. I don't know when that relationship went bad. Um, the way that I see it, it seems like her mom really didn't like him kind of from the start. Uh, her family seems to note that she started dating these kind of bad boys recently for some reason. They felt like she was falling into a bit of a bad crowd. So it could be that this relationship was already shot um, before she had uh, died. So 
I, I don't know if this is a result of what's happened or if this was just where this relationship al- already was for this family. Just to backtrack for a moment, uh, one other thing that you might notice on this picture of her arm is there there is what seems to be several small wounds. Now, some people are claiming that, that these are defensive wounds. Um, I don't I don't know if I could really say that, but something certainly happened to this woman's arm. Uh, from what I can see in the other picture, her other arm doesn't quite look like this. There is very clearly a bruise here, and it does look to me like it's in a position where someone might have uh, been restraining her wrist. It does kind of look to me like that could be a thumbprint of someone actually grabbing her wrist and and holding on to it. But I'm very curious about what some of her family has described as the holes, particularly around her hand area. Um, I really don't know what would develop those. I've never quite seen that in a case like this before. Um, and I don't know how old they are. We don't have the autopsy report, which would normally talk about every instance of this. They would talk about the measurements and they would give some information about how old they think that those abrasions or, or cuts are. Um, it's really... I, I don't know, but I just have to point it out to you guys because there does seem to be something weird about this hand in particular. And as I mentioned before, this is the hand that was up against the post um, of the, the mailbox. Jumping over to WMCActionNews5.com, uh, we get a little bit more insight about her family's thoughts on this. A young woman's parents are turning up the heat on investigators by using social media to press for answers surrounding their daughter's death. Family and friends are circulating a photo of Jessica's arm. They say the photograph, which shows cuts, bruises, and a shoe print, proves that something wasn't right. I already told you guys, I don't think it's a shoe print, but outside of that, the cuts are really interesting to me. Uh, I'm not sure if they've been cleaned at this point is another thing. Um, you know, the, they... If they were fresh, I would imagine there should should be some blood around where these actual punctures are. And I'm not, I can't really determine if that's happening in this photograph or not. But the main thing for me is certainly uh, the bruising around her wrist. That just, it really seems like there is likelihood that there was some type of violence towards her that might have been happening at this point. Uh, and based on things that her family has said, that might not be out of the realm of possibility or even as just a normal part of the relationship that she was having uh, with Mr. Uh, Garland Hart. And we know that, of course, he has a charge for domestic assault on him as well. So the likelihood that she was being abused in some way by him, I think, is quite reasonable. Um, just did that abuse lead to something happening her, to her on this particular day or not? I don't know. Uh, in the Crime Watch Daily special, they did talk to a friend that said another friend had been called by her, uh, went to the house to take her home, but ultimately that she wouldn't leave with that friend. It's really light detail. Uh, they didn't really get into it a lot more than that. So I don't know if that friend might have some more insight into, was there some type of physicality already going on between them at that point in the evening when they were arguing or not? Loved ones believe a combination of drug affiliations and an abusive relationship could be to blame for her death. And it kind of does raise a question for me, um, just in terms of how police looked at this. Um, I think the assumption, particularly from the friends and family angle, is police probably knew the people that were involved around this. Um, thought that she might have just been kind of part of this drug user crowd um, and, you know, decided to to end her life. And they really didn't want to look into it any further than that because of the type of people that she was associating with. And I do think it's a fair question from the family's perspective to say, hey, look, uh, you've already got a charge on this guy. Admittedly, it's, it's out of Tennessee. It's out of another state, but it's easy enough to find. Uh, it's specifically for a battery charge. Um, we've got some weirdness happening with her cell phone. We've got some very strange questions in terms of how her body was found. How can we just rule all this out and shut all this down and stop the investigation? And that's a, another thing that really surprised me about the Crime Watch Daily information was um, they showed that Dr. Godwin had basically access to 
all of her personal effects, they, they were turned back over to the family. So her purse that is actually in the photo of her, uh, her purse has been turned back over to her family. He did note that one of the clasps on the purse looked like it was broken, which is kind of interesting. Once again, might suggest that there was some type of physicality, some type of fighting or something going on leading up to the events of this night uh, or possibly on this night. But some very important pieces are not available, namely the actual shoelace. Somehow the shoelace has disappeared. The clothing that she was wearing apparently was sent to the funeral home in a biohazard bag, and it seems like the funeral home uh, disposed of the clothing by burning it. So it's really tough because at this point, um, you know, we have a, a coroner that's saying he thinks it's probably suicide, but it's now being reviewed at a state level. If that does get overturned for some reason, their ability to investigate it at this point is severely hampered. And it just does raise a very good question of even in cases where you believe it might likely be uh, someone harming themselves, shouldn't you process the scene in a way where there, sh there could be enough physical evidence to move forward if that gets overturned later or if someone else, another expert comes in and challenges that? Um, it seems like in this case in particular, they're going to have a really tough time if they do need to flip on this investigation and actually change the ruling. So jumping over to DeSotoTimes.com, uh, let's get some information from the coroner's perspective. DeSoto County Coroner Jeff Pounders says it's one of the strangest cases he has ever seen, but based on evidence and toxicology results, he stands by the official explanation of death by asphyxiation. Quote, I don't know how many people had driven by the mailbox and not seen her. The weeds were so tall. A toxicology report came back showing high levels of methamphetamine and Xanax in her system. So once again, uh, kind of pointing me to that mindset that this was possibly a party house. Maybe that's why she was staying there for a couple days, trying to keep it away from her children or, or her parents. Um, I don't know. Pounders has served as coroner for nearly three and a half decades. Now, I have looked at cases before and a lot of questions have come up um, about coroners because the regulations for becoming a coroner or the, the requirements vary state by state really severely. Um, I couldn't find specifics for DeSoto County where this took place, but another county in Mississippi, uh, Jackson, uh, I did find specifics on here, and here we can see to to just the qualifications for becoming a coroner, possess a high school diploma or its equivalent, be 21 years of age or older, be qualified to be elected in the county which you are elected, and then attend the Mississippi Crime Laboratory and State Medal Medical Examiner Death Investigation Training School, successfully completing all exams on the subject matter presented. It seems to me like the requirements for being a coroner in Mississippi are still a bit old school. Uh, you don't even have to have a college degree according to this. I tried to look more into this crime laboratory uh, investigation training school. I could find a website for it, but it really didn't have any information about what that process is like, how long that schooling is, how intensive it is. My feeling is it's probably a training course that takes a matter of possibly a couple months, maybe even as little as a couple of weeks. Then once you do become a coroner, you have to keep up with a certain number of continued education, which is 24 hours uh, annually. You're talking three school days per year. And I have seen some coverage about uh, some of the programs where that happens, and it's not flattering. Uh, in some cases, these guys treat it like a party weekend. They go and check in for they cl their class. They head over to the uh, the bar in, in the lobby of the hotel they're staying at, and, and that's about that. They go back at the end and they get their certificate. So a lot of questions for me in terms of the coroner in this case. Um, he is an elected official. He's been the same coroner in that county since the mid 80s. He's been there a long time. Um, and quite honestly, I looked into the requirements just for being a crime scene investigator in Mississippi and the requirements for that job, which you would think is kind of a lower job on the totem pole com compared to being the county coroner. Uh, the requirements for that job are way higher and do include uh, having at least a bachelor's degree. So... 
not to throw too much of a question on his determination, but his determination has been moved up to a state level. They're saying that that's going to take four to six months. According to another family that spoke up about this on Web Sleuths, they're saying that they heard that it was going to take six months for a case they were related in, and it took more like a year. So I don't know if we're going to hear of the, the final outcome from the state level on this case uh, anytime soon, but I will certainly... Uh, Keep, keep tabs on that and let you guys know if anything interesting develops around that. Now, the biggest thing that kind of blew my mind in terms of the Crime Watch Daily footage is let's talk about who thinks something weird is going on here. Of course, her family, which is not unheard of. You know, I, I can't think of a case where someone has decided to end their own life and the family said, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. So that's not completely out of the realm. But you've got her family her friends, and an expert now all saying they don't think that's the case. They think something else happened here, um, maybe not even at that location, and she was later moved to that location. The thing that blew my mind in the Crime Watch video is the guy that actually lives at the house, here's a quote from him, whatever happened to her, it didn't happen here. Uh, that kind of gave you the feeling that she didn't do it to herself, but he believes his good friend Garland Hart had uh, didn't have anything to do with it. So you've got the guy that even lives there saying there's something that looks wrong about how she was found. And I don't know that I really believe that she did that to herself and put herself there. On top of that, when they chased down Garland Hart and got him to speak, I do feel like something happened to her because I don't think she would do that to herself. Once again, we've got Garland, the guy that is in many eyes, the main suspect saying, you know what, it doesn't seem to make sense to me either, the way that she was found. So you literally have everyone on both sides of this case saying, I don't buy these circumstances. And the only people that do seem to believe these circumstances are the authorities and the coroner at this point, which is really what blows my mind about this case and is really why I wanted to cover it with you guys and discuss it a, a bit more. I don't know. Um, the way that I look at this, looking at the photo, studying the photo as much as I have, uh, there's a lot of oversimplifications that I see people make when they're commenting about the photo, about the way that she's found. There's no way that that's enough pressure. The, the main trouble I have with it is she's not facing away from the mailbox post. She's kind of to the side of it, and her face is actually pressed up against the mailbox post. So. I kind of struggle with it. That being said, I also struggle with some of the points that Dr. Godwin brings up about like, you know, being able to tie the knot out there, um, you know, when she's kneeling next to it, like, like I gave you guys, there's a pretty quick and easy, reasonable explanation for that. But I also consider, are you really going to use a shoelace for something like that? I mean, if you had a belt on your pants, wouldn't you use that? Uh, her purse was with her. There was a strap that she could unclick on both sides of her purse. Um, it just a shoelace seems like a really flimsy way to do it. And there is another possibility that we have to talk about here where was she potentially trying to scare her boyfriend by letting this other roommate know that, hey, I'm going to take these shoelaces and I'm going to go end my life. Uh, and then maybe she went to set it up to look like she was doing that, hoping someone was going to come out and rescue her and no one ever just came out and rescued her. I think we have to consider that's a possibility that it was almost because I think a lot of people agree it looks staged. Was she potentially the one that staged it, hoping that this was going to be a cry for help or a cry for attention from her boyfriend to come out and, and try to help her? And that raises some really tough questions for me. Supposedly, she left that house at six o'clock in the evening. Her body isn't found until between 10 and 11 a.m. the next morning. I believe this is a party house. I believe that there was several people in that house. Nobody thought, hey, Garland, where's your girlfriend? You know, it's it's eight o'clock. Where's your where's your girlfriend at this point? Ah, she's just outside. We're just gonna let her sit outside. Really doesn't make sense to me. No one stepped up or no one had a thought for a second about, hey, wasn't there a girl here earlier? Like what happened to her? Where'd she go? I mean, nobody? The homeowner? It really blows my mind. And then to know that there was a camera 
and somehow the footage that didn't get looked at is is like brain numbing to me. I, I just don't get that. Uh, even at the homeowner's level, I don't I don't believe his reasoning. I don't believe his excuses. If something like that went down and you knew you had a camera, I think the first thing you would do if you're a decent person is save that footage. I think the first thing you would do if you're an indecent person is say, you know what, we got to check that footage out and maybe possibly get rid of it or erase it if it shows my buddy setting this up or, or whatever. Somehow, some manipulation had to happen around that footage um, for it to just not be addressed at all is a really tough thing for me to swallow. And it's hard because I think the context of the scene when the police showed up told a story and it seems like they believed that story. It's just the real question is, was that really the truth or not? Was it, a, was it staged? And if it was staged, who did it? Was it someone that harmed her? Was it possibly herself? Was it someone else in some way that we haven't even discussed in this that just hasn't come out in media as being part of the story yet? I really don't know, but it's tragic. Um, her family did run a GoFundMe to cover her funeral expenses. They were looking to raise $5,000. As soon as they hit that level, they shut that down. Um, I kind of wish that they left it open because I certainly would like to donate some money to uh, to her children, just to, to give them something to uh, help support them going forward now that they've lost their mother. Uh, thankfully, since she was living with her mother as it is, I'm pretty sure her children are going to be in the same home, but obviously um, a big change with their, their mom now being gone. Um, are we ever going to see justice in this one, Brain Scratchers? I, I don't know, because I, st I still have a question of, is there a crime here or not? I kind of feel like there is. Um, I can understand why the family is so frustrated. And I just wanted to continue to raise some exposure to this because from what I can see, uh, a lot of the coverage on this uh, like really popped around July, seemed to die down very, very rapidly. Uh, Crime Watch Daily did their stuff in October. Once again, the coverage on this is just completely disappearing. I can't find any recent news articles on this whatsoever. Um, I'm really hoping that this isn't one of those cases that, you know, people are just trying to bury and make go away and we're never going to hear a news update on this again. Uh, hopefully the determination from the Mississippi state coroner level is going to get, give us another pulse of information and maybe give us a shot at, uh, finding justice in this case, if it really, if it really needs it. Uh, a, a couple of points that Dr. Godwin brought up are, obviously a uh, confession of some kind or some information from someone that knows something. If there was someone that was at that house or if there's someone that is friends of someone that was at that house that heard them say something, uh, that type of information could be super, super critical. Uh, so I am including contact information for the police department in the description box below, just in case anyone out there thinks that they might have a piece to this puzzle uh, in, in either direction, just anything that is to step this closer to the truth, because the family certainly deserves that, even if it's understanding that this is not the outcome that they want it to be. Thank you so much uh, for joining me on today's Brain Scratch. I told you guys it was a, a bit of a tough one. I appreciate each and every one of you out there. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Keep yourselves and your family safe, and I'll see you back here on the Lord and Arts channel on Monday.